The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Karen Campbell, and I'm the Assistant Director for the National Adult Protective Services Association. And I'm very happy to welcome you all to today's webinar, which is hosted by the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center, the APS TARC. Thank you all so much for being here today. Um, our webinar today is Dementia 101, what every APS worker needs to know about dementia and neurocognitive disorders. Next slide, please. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'm gonna hand the mic over to Andy for a moment to talk about the APS TARC. Thank you, Karen. Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew Capehart with the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center. So a quick disclaimer before we get started, the Adult Protective Services Technical Assistance Resource Center, or APS TARC as we call it, is a project of the U.S. Administration for Community Living, Administration on Aging, Department of Health and Human Services, administered by WRMA Incorporated. Contractors' findings, conclusions, and points of view do not necessarily represent the official policy of the federal government. Uh, next slide. A quick note about our APS TARC. We're here to help APS programs in any way that we can. Just reach out to us. Um, some contact info will be displayed at the end of the webinar. We work to enhance the effectiveness of APS programs by working with partners on use of data and analytics, applying research and evaluation to practice, and encouraging the use of innovative practices and strategies. Uh, next slide. We'd like to make a quick plug for our peer-to-peer -peer calls. We have three of these calls each month for APS workers, supervisors, and administrators, respectively. You can see the schedule on your screen here. If you'd like to register for one of these calls, just visit our webpage and click on the peer support link for details. You can also reach out to us via email, and the email will be displayed again at the end of the webinar. Uh, next slide. And then lastly, we encourage you to take a look at our APS and COVID-19 page. It contains some resource information, a federal brief addressing personal safety and continuity of operations, and also a summary of state program responses to the pandemic. So you might find that helpful in these very uncertain times. Um, I will now turn things back over to Karen. All right, thank you, Andy. Uh, next slide, please. Awesome. Okay, so just a few. Um, I'm going to go over before we get started a few um, pointers and tips on interacting with the software that we're using for today's webinar. Uh, so that you all know, we are recording the webinar and it will be posted on the APS TARPS website in the near future. Um, in order to connect to audio, you will need to go to, um, there should be a panel that popped up on the right hand side of your screen that has an audio option. You'll press the little carrot next to the word audio and then choose computer audio. Um, all attendees are muted for the duration of the presentation. However, if you have questions or comments, um, and if you uh, this includes content related or tech related questions, please write those into that questions box that can also be found in that right hand control panel that popped up when you entered the webinar. Um, we will be responding to any technology related questions within the questions box and content related questions will be monitored throughout the presentation. And we have a couple of points at which we'll read them aloud for the presenter to address. I want to note we have quite a few people signed up for and on today's webinar. So we're going to do our best to get through as many questions as we possibly can. Um, but we apologize in advance if we aren't able to get to all of them. As we're going through, we do have a few poll questions for you. Um, so please keep a lookout for them. And then also you can access the copy of the slides for today in the handout section, which is also on that control panel to the right of your screen. Um, and there are a couple of reference tools that are also uploaded within that handout section that um, our presenter will be referencing during today's presentation. Um, so next slide, please. So before we get started, we have a poll question right out the gate to get an idea of today's audience. Um, Andy, would you mind launching the poll? Thank you. Certainly. I've just launched that. Um, so which of the following categories do you identify the most with? Are you an adult protective services professional, other social services professional, medical or legal professional, or would you consider yourself other? And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen, letting us know which of these apply to you most. Um, we've got a bunch of votes coming in, so we're going to keep it open for just a few more seconds to see what uh, the results are. Again, if you'd like to vote on the poll, just click on your screen directly and um, your 
your response will be registered for us. We keep it open for just about five more seconds, and then I'll share the results with everybody. All right, I'm going to close that poll out now and then share the results with everybody. It looks like 71% are APS professionals. We've got 19% who are uh, fall under other social services, 4% medical, 2% legal, and uh, another 4% that consider themselves other from all those. Thanks for taking the poll. Wonderful. Thanks, Andy. Uh, next slide, please. So today, we will be hearing from Dr. Irving Hellman. Dr. Hellman is a licensed geropsychologist in private practice in Sacramento, California, and he has been since 1985. He's a graduate of Yale University and completed his doctorate in clinical psychology at the University of California, Davis. He's an active member of the section of geropsychology in the Division of Clinical Psychology of the American Psychology Association and is a founding member and prior chair of the Sacramento Financial Abuse Specialist Team. He also has been providing training to APS workers throughout California and nationally for about 20 years. So without further ado, uh, thank you so much for being here with us today, Dr. Holman, and now I will hand it off to you. Next slide, please. Thank you, Karen. Um, I am looking forward to this, and uh, we have a limited time to go over a lot of material on dementia. And if um, you have any further questions that we can't get to, feel free to contact me by email or calling me at the number uh, listed here. Uh, I'm always, I'm very devoted to the eradication and the prevention of elder abuse and helping APS workers uh, with uh, their work as I've been an internal consultant for our local Sacramento APS uh, for the last 15 years. Currently, my activities are uh, generally working with a local PACE uh, program that we have, a program that's all-inclusive for the care of elderly. I don't know if other people in other jurisdictions have this, and I'm still active in our uh, local FAST, Financial Abuse Specialist Team. Um, and uh, these are some of the activities that I do. Uh, and let's uh, move on to the... Um, program. So today we're going to cover the good, the bad, and the ugly of dementia. Uh, we're going to cover the neurocognitive changes that occur and the risks uh, for getting dementia, uh, the biggest uh, type of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and then talk about some of the other ones and talk about those types of dementias that are reversible. Then if there's time, I'll uh, review some rapid assessment screens and talk about mental capacity and dementia. Given that I'm a psychologist, uh, my primary uh, use uh, by APS is to go out to homes and uh, conduct uh, mental capacity evaluations for those folks that uh, physicians are not willing to provide uh, capacity declarations on. So let's talk about the demographics of the aging population in America. Longevity has actually gone down because of the opioid crisis, so now it's 79 years. Most of the people uh, that are aging that are our clients, that's an APS, the vulnerable ones are living alone. Um, and the fastest growing segment of the population are 85 year olds and older, and they are also the most at risk. Now, when I work with elders, it's important to keep in mind <clears throat> what some of the major uh, standards are uh, to help guide us uh, when we get lost. And in my work as a health professional, I'm always uh, focusing on uh, the uh, need for personal protection, safety, and the law enforcement and legal professionals that I work with are most concerned with self-determination and the need of elders to have primary control. And so lots of times the whole issue of mental capacity comes into play here. Uh, do people have the right to make decisions to protect themselves, to keep themselves safe, or are they beyond that? And oftentimes dementia is one of those uh, conditions that will render people incapable of making those decisions that are in their best interest. 
So let's talk about normal cognitive decline. Uh, everybody thinks that when they start to forget certain things, where they where the car is in the parking lot, where they put the keys, if they're starting to get Alzheimer's disease, and these are so, and it's actually a normal thing for us to lose some working memory capacity, uh, the ability to remember things that happened uh, within the day. Also, our executive functions get a little weaker and uh, our inhibition uh, reduces as our distractibility increases. This is one of the reasons why hearing becomes so difficult in crowded places because we can't inhibit background noise as well. Also note that processing speed reduces. So everything that we do gets slower and slower as we age. I certainly have experienced that myself. So some of the risks of neurocognitive uh, uh, decline are age. One of the biggest risk factors is age. The older we get, the more our neurocognitive capacities decline and we're more at risk as getting dementia. Um, medical conditions can also uh, contribute to decline uh, medication and medication mismanagement, different uh, lifestyle changes, particularly sleep. Sleep is coming out to be a very, very important function of our daily life, and it can interfere with older people's neurocognitive functioning. Social isolation can, substance abuse, and finally, even elder abuse. Uh, and uh, of the, the primary risks of uh, neurocognitive decline are the three Ds, dementia being the primary one, but there's also depression and delirium. Depression and delirium are reversible, so I will touch on those because if we can differentiate that from uh, dementing process, then those are the elders that uh, can uh, have their functioning restored if their depression or delirium is treated adequately. So dementia from the DSM-5 uh, is defined uh, in uh, two ways. One is that there's an impairment in cognitive performance, and there's also a deficit uh, in independence and functioning the independence. And there's two types now that are defined in the um, DSM. Uh, in blue here, there's mild and there's major. And mild is what uh, some of you may be familiar with, that is mild cognitive impairment. But before we move there, the deficits of independence are defined primarily as the IADLs not the ADLs, uh, which are uh, more um, personal care, uh, but um, those things that decline first, the ability to drive independently, financial management, and medication and medical management. Those are the three red flags in IADLs that tend to decline and tend to lead to calls to APS uh, of concern for elders that are uh, losing uh, these abilities in their independence. So as I mentioned, we'll talk about MCI, mild cognitive impairment. Uh, there's a lot of work that's been done to try to identify uh, when this, when and if this is occurring in elders, and it's more of a memory problem than one would typically find from normal aging. So uh, the types of memory it, that is um, impaired is encoding the going in of information and retrieval, the ability to bring it back out from uh, our memory stores in our brain. And uh, the behavioral signs in terms of the type of memory is a rapid forgetting of new things, so not being able to remember uh, what happened yesterday or what ha what a person had for uh, breakfast and or what was just said to a an older person. In addition, delayed recall also is diminished. That's um, 
the ability to remember things after a half an hour to an hour. And finally, uh, language, uh, verbal fluency, particularly the ability to uh, speak in a rhythmic manner uh, at a speed that's normal um, and um, without a lot of interference. And, and there are certain ways to assess all these three types. So there's memory function and there's language function uh, that uh, slows down and can be impaired in a significant way. Uh, and the important thing about mild uh, assessing for mild cognitive impairment and being able to identify it is that 25 to 50 percent of people with MCI will convert to dementia within five years. So it's sort of a precursor to dementia that's being identified. And hopefully when there are medications and treatments for dementia, the people with MCI will be the first that are targeted to get these treatments. So let's go back to some of the criteria for the diagnosis of dementia. This is the major dementia uh, that uh, I spoke of earlier in an earlier slide. The most important symptoms to identify are the ones in blue, impairment of short-term memory, uh, impairment of expressive language, that's verbal fluency and the ability to name that sometimes will turn into an agnostic state, um, and finally, executive functions. If you don't leave this uh, webinar with anything, you should remember that these are the three types of system uh, symptom clusters that you should be looking for if you're going to screen for dementia, short-term memory, language, and executive functions. So executive functions, for those who need a little reminding, are um, there are cognitive signs and there are behavioral signs. The common cognitive ones are memory, combining words and visuals, categorizing, and multitasking, uh, being able to uh, pursue a goal through its completion. This is one of those things that many elders that will visit in their homes have a hard time with, and uh, they get interrupted in the middle of something and might forget and move on to something else, and before you know it, their water has run over from their sink or their bathtub, or they've left the uh, flame on on their stove and uh, they are um, at risk. And some of the behavioral signs are impaired uh, organization, as I just um, gave an example of, impulsivity, tactlessness, and aggressiveness, and perseveration those people that repeat themselves over and over and over again and have a hard time monitoring their responses, observing themselves, self-observing is very difficult when one has weak executive functions. There's also social cognition being impaired. This is a new concept, but it's one of those things that we can often assess when we do home visits uh, because people who may be coming demented, have a difficult time understanding social interactions, are insensitive to social standards, and demonstrate poor interpersonal control. So if someone that I met, uh, I knock on an older person's door, they answer the door, uh, they see my smile, and they let me right in without asking me who I am or what I'm doing there, uh, I might question uh, whether they uh, have weak social cognition, and that's putting them at risk for being exploited. This is the uh, distribution of dementia. Uh, as you can see, Alzheimer's is more than 50%. That's why it gets all the news and all the uh, press. Uh, there also is uh, Parkinson's, which is the next most common. Then there are other causes, and under other causes uh, would be um, Lewy body disease, frontotemporal, and um, 
brain injury would be um, having trauma, multiple causes would be those cases that are mixed. Uh, you have Alzheimer's disease with Lewy body disease. You have frontotemporal with Parkinson's. You have Lewy body with Parkinson's. Lots of dementias are combinations of, of multiple uh, dementias. And finally, there are um, vascular dementia, uh, which is caused by strokes, by brain bleeds. Alzheimer's disease, the most common one, if you're not going to screen for anything, you should at least consider this one. Uh, once again, uh, the main types of symptoms that you're looking to screen are memory, language, and executive functions. So this is uh, in a brain where you uh, have the location for these different functions. The hippocampus is where memories are stored. The basal forebrain is where executive functions occur. Okay. This is the uh, a picture of a nerve cell and the two causes, the two primary causes that they've determined for Alzheimer's disease are amyloid plaques, and the amyloid plaques get in between the, the axons of the cells where communication occurs and uh, blocks uh, the neurotransmitters from getting across and slowly atrophies the cell from the axons to the, uh, to the cell body. And tau neurofibril neurofibrillary tangles are found in the cell body itself. And these things also have a way of, uh, of diminishing the size and the existence of living tissue in uh, nerve cells. So um, the tau uh, diminishes, uh, atrophies nerve cells from the inside out, the plaques, atrophy the nerve cells from the outside in, but atrophy is what you get. So with that, um, these are a picture of two brains. One is an Alzheimer's brain, one is a normal brain. And let's take a poll, which one uh, is the brain with Alzheimer's disease, the top one, or the bottom one. And um, yeah, thanks, Dr. Hamlin, for going back. I thought <clears throat> this is the NDK part. If people could look at the image a little bit longer, and I will launch that poll right now. Let us know if you think which is the brain with Alzheimer's disease, the top one or the bottom one. And you can vote by clicking directly on your screen, just as you did with the other poll that we had. So we'll keep that open for a few seconds so that folks will have a chance to click on their screen and respond. <laughs> And again, if you want to vote, you can just um, click directly on your screen and let us know if you think it's the top one or the bottom one. Keep that open for about 10 more seconds, giving folks a chance to vote. All right, and I'm going to close that poll out now and share the results with everybody. It looks like 81% said it's the bottom one, Dr. Hellman, and 19% said it was the top image. Okay, so can I go back? Yep, yes. we got you back. Now. There we go. Remember, the key word is atrophy. Size does matter. So which one is smaller? It's the one on the top. So indeed, the top one is the Alzheimer's brain. See, this material here, the size of this brain is much larger. It has a lot more cell mass that's articulated in like a mountain. And this one is more like a desert where the mountain has been eroded and all you have is flat plain left and a lot less neuronal material, the result of atrophy of those cells dying year after year after year from amyloid plaques and uh, tangles. Okay, so. Let's move on. So 
this is a very important slide. You have the ability to um, get a copy of these slides, and um, this provides you with the model for Alzheimer's over time. Uh, there are basic risk factors. There's a gene, the APOE gene. There's plaques and tangles, which can be observed now uh, with PET scans. There's hypertension, so uh, cardiovascular involvement uh, is in uh, brain deterioration is very high when uh, people have Alzheimer's. Depression can be a risk factor. Diabetes also affecting uh, cardiovascular function. Uh, physical inactivity uh, actually is a risk factor. So uh, one way to avoid or to uh, pro provide a little bit of uh, lower risk is to stay active and lower education. Uh, then there's the preclinical phase, increased age. As I said before, uh, age is uh, one of the major risk factors. By the time people are 85, 50% of them uh, likely uh, are, have, are in the beginning stages, if not uh, further on, of having Alzheimer's. And uh, luckily, uh, most people uh, will not uh, die from Alzheimer's because most people, as you saw from the uh, average age, won't live to be 85. MCI is another risk factor and gait deteriorates. People become uh, less secure in walking, in moving, their balance diminishes, and this has a strong frontal lobe component to it. So it's important to keep active as much as possible. Finally, there's the malignant phase, which is when the behavior starts to show and the symptoms start to be obvious to others. So there's personality change, memory change, and impairment in executive functions. If people live long enough, uh, they develop uh, language difficulties, uh, knowing difficulties, agnosia is being able to recognize things from memory, apraxia is the ability to move in space, uh, sensory motor uh, organization and perception. Okay. And this is a, a way of illustrating the progress of Alzheimer's over time. See, this is sort of everything's going along normally here until uh, someone might be diagnosed with MCI. And then with MCI, 50% of the cases develop into Alzheimer's disease and 50% don't. And they go on to have a normal aging progress until death. Now, this is also an important slide. This differentiates the different types of dementia. Uh, so, and it differentiates them by pattern of onset and course. Uh, so, um, Alzheimer's disease uh, slowly, uh, uh, its onset is gradual and it increases, the risk increases with age uh, as the same with Parkinson's, with vascular dementia. It's sudden because it has to do with brain attacks and those occur, a, a bleed can happen at any time. And then after the bleed, one can get a gradual deterioration of uh, cognitive functioning, which is the dementia from the stroke that occurs afterwards. Lewy body, uh, which is becoming more identified as we learn more about it. Its onset also increases with age, but it has a much more rapid course than Alzheimer's disease. So one of the clear ways of distinguishing it is its rapid course. Also, there are problems with visual hallucinations that occur with Lewy body. And very important is that short-term memory remains another thing that distinguishes it from Alzheimer's. Frontotemporal has an early onset, which distinguishes it from all the other dementias, a rapid course, which is similar to Lewy body, and once again, intact memory. Okay, so questions.
All right, thank you all so much um, for those of you who have written in questions so far. Um, we do have quite a few. One of the questions is, can brain injury trigger underlying genetic predisposition of Alzheimer's? Yes, um, as I said before, brain injury, particularly concussions, uh, increase the risk of uh, Alzheimer's disease um, substantially. So uh, if you know people or yourself have had a concussion from a car accident or a sports uh, event, it's very important to protect your head and not have another one because the more concussions one has, the more one is at risk for dementia. And we know a lot about this from uh, what has uh, come up uh, in the news and in research regarding NFL football players and that type of dementia that they are all developing now. Great, Another thank question. You. Yeah, we had a couple of questions that are related to uh, dementia, development of de dementia related to alcohol use. Um, so one of them is what role does alcohol abuse have in getting dementia? And another one that's, that's kind of related is, is alcohol dementia reversible? Um, there's a type of alcohol dementia called Korsakoff syndrome, which is a uh, lack of a certain vitamin. I can't tell you which one it is, and it mainly occurs because of poor diet of alcoholics. But in addition, uh, it's been uh, determined that the, the more chronic a person's alcohol use, the more atrophy of the brain and uh, therefore the higher the risk for developing a dementia afterwards. It's not directly related to alcohol, but it's, it's a risk factor that contributes to atrophy. Finally, um, clinically, whenever I work with people and they appear to be much older than their chronological age, uh, it, nine times out of 10, they've had a history with alcohol or they've been a smoker. So it, it prematurely ages people, therefore increasing their risk of dementia uh, because of that increased risk over time with age. Okay, so we'll have time for more questions afterwards. Let's move on. So reversible dementia, these are the things that are medical conditions that can make people appear to be demented, whereas if the medical condition is treated, they can reverse back. So we, as uh, first responders to elders that are uh, diminishing in their functioning, uh, we can play a vital role and advocating for them to be worked up fully uh, for their physical functioning and for their medical conditions, uh, so that uh, it's not so that it's determined if they have something that can be treated, they can come back to normal functioning and be less cognitively impaired. Uh, notice uh, some of the things are meds. You actually have pseudo dementias from people who are uh, substantially depressed, they can look like they're demented, and the same goes with a delirium uh, situation. Um, some cardiovascular conditions are sometimes the medications that people are taking for their chronic cardiovascular conditions uh, can, when they're not uh, well balanced, can make them look like they're demented infections, uh, certainly contribute to uh, something we're going to talk about soon. Even nutritional problems and problems with sleep can make people seem demented. Depression uh, is uh, quite common. 25% of elders uh, will have it at some point in the course of their uh, life from 65 uh, on. and. Um, Notice that the, this uh, bottom part, that the cognitive symptoms of dementia, which are reversible, all are 
uh, comparable to some of those uh, cognitive symptoms of Alzheimer's disease, uh, short-term memory problems, verbal disfluency, and executive dysfunction. So it's very important to rule out um, depression when one is thinking that a client might be demented. So, um, and these are the primary, these are what they call the, um, oh dear, I'm having a demented moment now. I can't remember it now. Uh, but these are the primary physical symptoms of depression from sleep uh, to suicidal ideation. And uh, as a, uh, as another poll, I wonder if you might guess which is the most common symptom uh, for elder depression, sleep. So you can take it from there. Yeah, oh, oh, no problem. Um, Dr. Howland, there's sleep problems, loss of energy, change in appetite, weight, anhedonia, loss of interest in usual activities, and suicidal ideation. Um, you can vote by clicking directly on your screen. <laughs> And we'll leave that up for just a bit so folks can pick their answer. And we'll leave it up for just a few more seconds to give folks a chance to vote. All right, and I'll close that poll out now and share the results. It looks like ooh, pretty close between anhedonia at 38%, sleep problems at 35%. And Excellent, people. Yeah. Excellent. You've taken my workshop before. Anhedonia, loss of interest in usual activities, is indeed the most uh, common symptom with sleep problems being a close second. So you guys are uh, are tuned in to elder depression. That's good. So with old, with older people who are not depressed, uh, they won't tell you that um, that they've given up activities that, you, that 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 they don't do things that used to give them pleasure the way that depressed people will do. Uh, Non-depressed people, when they become disabled and unable to do something like read because their vision is bad, will develop other interests that replace the ones that they, they used to give them joy so that they continue to have sources of joy in their life all the time uh, versus those that become very passive and lose interest in activities and, uh, and basically give up. It's the giving up versus the continuing to stay engaged in life. So there's a scale for this one. If you're not familiar, um, I haven't, this is a uh, open source. So you can just uh, Google GDS and you can get a copy of this one. This is a good way of screening uh, for depression. It, uh, it, you can just ask the questions. It can be part of an interview. And uh, it's it's very helpful in um, in screening for that, so that you can make a referral to a primary care physician to see if they can treat their patient for depression, to see if they can uh, get it to reverse and get those people to uh, function. The other thing is, people elders uh, respond very well to cognitive behavioral therapy as another mode of treatment for depression, and it can reverse the depression within uh, six weeks. Delirium, the other risk factor, the other D uh, that can make people look um, demented. Uh, even though we don't have a poll, uh, the most um, uh, common cause of delirium is a infection. A uh, UTI infection. People will get a UTI infection. Oftentimes they won't know they even have an infection because it doesn't have a lot of physical symptoms with it and their mental functioning can change rather quickly. Disorientation, memory loss, language and visual perceptual. As soon as the UTI is treated, um, uh, their cognitive uh, functioning uh, comes back. And it's very important to rule out 
delirium when someone has a sudden course of change of mental status because it could lead to a life-threatening situation if it's not treated. So let's talk about dementia screening. Uh, there's self-report and presentation. There's collateral reports that we get from uh, these uh, people. And then there are red flags. And the most important red flags to keep in mind when we're thinking in terms of, of dementia and neurocognitive decay are, are memory, forgetting, executive functions, and language, where there's repetition and difficulty with articulation and, um, and, and speed, okay? So these are some screens that I've provided you with. Sacramento County uses the slums uh, in general. Um, and what I like to tell people to do is to use these screens, not so, I, I encourage people, they don't have to use these screens to get a total score, but they can use parts of these screens to uh, look for uh, those mental functions that are going to be most affected by neurocognitive decline, memory, executive functions and language so and one of the most um telling questions for elders and for you when you're screening people for dementia is the year if people think that we're still in 1900 well houston we got a problem this also has a memory test on it where you ask people to remember five words and um, they repeat those words right after you ask them to remember it. And, um, and then this also has a category test. And categories um, are uh, interesting. They are actually a test of both verbal fluency and executive functions. And their executive functions because to put things, the only way to come up with 15 plus animals in a minute is um, if you categorize them to, to things like your domestic animals, your farm animals, and your zoo animals. Notice that this one also has the clock drawing on it. Very simple and very telling screening test. Uh, and I'll speak about that in a moment. Um, I don't find this part of the slums very useful, this paragraph. And so I won't use the slums much for that because it's pretty difficult for people. And uh, it's a more difficult kind of memory test that, uh, that people have a hard time with. So let's look at the next one. That is the MOCA. Also, uh, it's available uh to the public and this one has the cognitive functions that it's testing for so you have executive functions naming and language memory language abstraction which is executive functions and delayed recall which is memory again so this is really a nice uh organized screening tool for memory executive functions and language, those things that you want to screen for if you're not going to screen for anything else with regard to dementia. And um, this one has a nice delayed recall where you ask people to uh, learn and you give people two times, two trials to learn five words. And then at the end of the screening with these interrupters here, you ask them, what were those five words that you learned earlier? And that's um, a very good test for this delayed recall. So you can get a sense of whether they, uh, if they're not demented, if they're starting to develop MCI, because as you can recall from that one slide, mild cognitive impairment has a, a real decline in delayed recall. 
orientation is also here. And once again, you have the year, the most telling uh, orientation question. Okay, so here's the clock drawing. You ask people to draw a clock. Generally with this one, uh, you would fold this in half so that you just have a blank uh, for where they're to draw the clock, the circle, put the numbers where they belong and tell the time 10 minutes after 11. So what this is doing, it's executive function because they're having to multitask and to switch sets to go from a circle to numbers to hands, very abstract and switching uh, and it's somewhat verbal memory. And uh, when people are demented, they have a hard time uh, remembering that it starts with a 12 rather than a one. Uh, and they have a hard time with the orientation of where the hands go, and it can be very confusing for them. So let's talk about mental capacity in the last few minutes. Sig uh, dementia significantly compromises mental capacity for these functions. Testamentary is the drawing up of a will. Medical is whether to uh, pursue certain medical procedures. Financial is any kind of financial uh, uh, obligations that people are involved with. And finally, the ability to make decisions uh, for the safe li living independently. And decisional capacity has been defined uh, by Grisso and uh, number of other people, I don't think we can see the citation here, um, as understanding the pertinent issues, uh, possessing the mental capacity to make an intelligent choice uh, by understanding and comprehending the issues, reasoning, understanding the rationale for the decision, and appreciating the ramification of the decisions. So at least two of these are executive function. The rationale coming up with the reason for something and the integrating, analyzing, and manipulating information. So executive function is highly involved in making uh, decisions in an elder's best interest. And finally, the ability to express a choice which is what people who hoard have a difficult time doing because they can't decide what to throw out. And there's, I share this with all the people I work with in APS, there's a significant safety risk with the presumption that older adults with dementia possess mental capacity. So I'm not saying that if someone is demented, then they don't have capacity but they are at serious risk of not having capacity if they have signs of dementia. And in California, we have a CAP deck, the GC335, and it's defined uh, what the judge asks for is for the doctor to identify uh, problems in all these areas. Once again, we see memory and language. There's two items for language, understanding of quantities, and three items for executive functions. So you got memory, language, executive functions. Once again, those are the three functions that you want to be focusing on when you are screening for dementia in the clients that you meet. So, one way that dementia significantly increases the risk for elder abuse is in self-neglect. 50% of the cases are self-neglect here in Sacramento, and I would assume in all other jurisdictions as well. Uh, risks for self-neglect are elders who are isolated uh, and let themselves go, neurocognitive disorders like dementia and depression. And it can lead to this kind of thing, hoarding, uh, where they have difficulty in making the choice as well as other types.
types of functions that are required for uh, mental capacity. And finally, it also increases the risk for financial abuse. Uh, a researcher, uh, Lichter, uh, what's his name? Lichtenberg. Peter Lichtenberg. Lichtenberg. Who's put together a financial capacity uh, screening tool uh, in earlier research found that 50% of person of people with mild Alzheimer's disease, those with just mild cognitive impairment uh, had compromised financial capacity, couldn't be judged to make financial decisions in their best interest. And those with, uh, with moderate Alzheimer's disease, though still functioning in the community, but showing clear-cut signs of compromised mental capacity, 93% uh, of those uh, had compromised financial capacity. So it's very, very, uh, uh, it, it puts people at high risk of uh, being financially exploited uh, to be even mildly demented. So with that, uh, I think we have more questions. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Holman. So um, we have quite a few questions that have come through. Um, I'm going to start with one that I've kind of uh, taken a few questions and put together to summarize. We had quite a few questions come in related to risk factors for dementia. Um, and I compiled a, a quick list of the specific uh, components that people were asking about. So some folks asked, um, are things like diet, uh, poor sleeping habits long term, seizure disorders, uh, not taking prescribed medications or abusing prescribed medications, chronic mental health conditions, substance abuse, and developmental or intellectual disabilities risk factors for later developing dementia. And I'm happy to read that list again, if that's helpful, I know it's long. <laughs> yes, if you, it, it'll be, I think, too much to find that slide, but if you, uh, I have an early slide that um, that indicated all those are uh, put people at, at higher risk of developing dementia, uh, whether it's primary and physical or or it's or it's secondary and it contributes to uh, to to physical. Um, and I would say that the highest risk factors of all those would be poor sleep. Uh, social isolation, um, uh, drug uh, mismanagement, uh, and depression. 50% of uh, elders who have a history of depression uh, develop dementia in later life. All right, thank you. Next question. Do you have any tips for capacity assessments done by phone as we're not seeing many people in person currently? Very hard by phone, but yes, I would you want to you want to get a screen for those three cognitive functions: memory, language, and executive functions. So memory would start with what year we're in because that's something that people have year after year after year we've had 20 years to learn that we're not in 1900 so if people think that they're in 1900 then their memory is going to be impaired uh you can ask them to remember your name you can still give them the list and assess for that so that the the five words is much better than three words and to do it the way the mocha does would even be better but that's a completely verbal thing they don't have to see anything for that one so you can use that for memory for language uh you can do a categories test with them on the phone you can do all these things except for the clock drawing really and for executive functions um uh you can also do uh, the categories test, the naming the animals. Uh, you can ask people things like uh, what's, I always ask people this one, 
this tests for their ability to uh, to 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 their rationale for decisions, their ability to multitask and to to do things through a conclusion. And this is the question: What would you do if you came home, you opened the door, and there was a foot of water on the floor? And then you want to hear that people would go to the source. You don't want to hear them just say that, oh, I'd close the door and call my son, or I'd call the manager for the building, or I'd call the fire department. You want to see them systematically think through the problem and problem solve it. So those are some examples for how to do it on the phone. But you want to use the screening things that you know or the tools that you have, once again, to assess primarily for memory, language, and executive functions. Any other questions? Great, thank you. Yes, we have a few more. Um, what suggestions do you have on how to decrease agitation, paranoia, delusions, um, delusions at evening and sleep hours? Uh, right. Um, it, it's very well. You you have to rule out that they're not that they're not suffering from delirium. Um, the atypical antipsychotics work really well uh, for a time limited basis with uh, psychotic types of uh, delusions like those. Uh, having a regular sleep pattern is also very important. Um, and it depends on where the person is, if they're isolated, if they're living in a facility, if they're living with family members, how you would go about with that type of an intervention. Uh, but it is uh, treatable and primarily people are put on a short term course of one of the atypical antipsychotics like Seroquel or Respiradone or Zyprexa. Uh, and uh, some of them, uh, some physicians are starting to use um, the uh, mood stabilizers. And I can't think of their names right now. That in a stable environment that, that so that they're not disoriented in, and, and they're going through a regular routine. Great, thank you. Um, we are coming up close to the end of the hour, but I will ask uh, one more of the questions that came in. The question is, how do you deal with competing family members trying to influence your evaluation? Say one daughter is pushing for a finding of incapacity, another pushing for independence. You go back to those core principles. The first core principle is best interest of the elder. And you remind all the family members, I'm here for for the elder, that's who my client is. Not you, not the doctor, not the brother, not the daughter, but the elder. And, and our focus is what's in her, his best interest. And then of course, there's the whole issue of safety versus self-determination. And, um, and what I like to do when I'm doing assessments or when I'm with a client, lots of times there will be an, a, a family member who has it in their mind to interfere with the assessment or with the decision or, um, or the, uh, the advice that, that will be, uh, that I'll come up with. So sometimes it's helpful to separate them from the elder so that you can do your work with the elder without the interference of that family member. So it helps to have another person there with you. All right, great. Thank you so much. Um, we are right at the end of that hour. So um, I was wondering, would you mind going to the last slide? There we go. Perfect. So this last slide provides contact information for the APS Technical Assistance Resource Center should you want to reach out. Um, but thank you so much to all of you for attending and listening to the presentation today. And a huge thank you so much to Dr. Hellman for sharing your time and expertise with us. I hope you all have a great rest of your day.